Welcome to this week's edition of Inter-University Debate, which is brought to you by Centre for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV. I'm your moderator for this debate. My name is Lake Agenda Fancy. I'm an advocate, a lecturer, and a tax consultant. Now, since Uganda discovered the commercial oil quantity in 2006, there have been several issues that have come up uh, in the oil and gas sector. And today we sit and discuss those issues with students of uh, IUIU, that is Islamic University in Uganda. Students of Islamic University in Uganda, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So today uh, we are looking at oil prospects. To what extent will oil revenue address the social economic challenges in Uganda? So like I mentioned, since the commercial oil discovery in 2006, Several issues have come up. We have seen hashtags on Twitter that are still running up to now, Stop Eacop. We have seen the EU report where the EU sat and decided to halt the operations of Total in Uganda. We have seen issues of human rights, environmental issues coming up, several people questioning uh, whether the oil money will even reach the citizens, issues of corruption. So today, all those issues will be discussed today. Before we go into the merits of today's discussion, let me introduce the panelists for today. I'll start with the gentleman that is seated right next to me. He's very familiar uh, with the inter-university debate since he was in the previous season. And that is Mr. Magala Fred. Fred is pursuing Bachelor of Laws from IUIU. And then he is the Justice and Constitutional Affairs Minister He's a Nobat Mao of IUI. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's also the speaker of LSS. You said LSS stands for? Law Student Society. Okay, Law Student Society. So yeah. that is your, it's like the Uganda Law Society of IUI. Yeah. 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 True, true. Okay, so you're welcome to the Inter University debate. Thank you. Okay, our second panelist for today is Ms. Tusime Pauline. Yes, Pauline is the state minister. Islamic University Students Union is a state minister and chairperson Moot Court Committee. You're welcome to the Inter University. Uh, thank you. A little bit of correction. I'm a state minister for constitutional affairs. Oh, a... so you're his state minister? Yes. Okay, so you're seated next to your boss. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our third panelist for today is Ms. Asimwe Macklin. Yes. Yes, Macklin is the Clark Moot Court Committee and pursuing Bachelor of Law. So you're all law students. Yes. Back in, you're welcome to the Inter-University debate. Thank you so much. Okay. Our fourth panelist for today is Mr. Lemmy John Bosco. Bosco is also pursuing Bachelor of Laws at Islamic University in Uganda. And he is the Deputy Chairperson Debate Committee and Presidential Advisor on on-campus affairs. You're welcome to the Inter-University debate. Thank you. Yes. So to our panelists today, as mentioned, we are talking about the oil prospects and uh, the, how the discovery of oil and gas in Uganda is going to solve the social economic issues in Uganda. And as we know, Uganda has grappled with several social economic issues, which uh, I'll leave it to come out from the panelists at a later state. And we have seen the excitement from the population when the final investment decision was signed. So we will look at in this debate, will the oil prospects live up to our expectations and excitement? So before we delve deep into the discussion, let's start with the overview. And I'll start with you, Fred. Uh, what is the historical overview of the oil and gas sector in Uganda? Thank you, Ms. Gender Fancy. Um, Uganda is a, an old nation and uh, did not only start from independence, but draws way back uh, from our ethnicity and everything. So when it comes to oil and gas, the industry, the industry's history draws back to over 1925. That is uh, by a report that was made by a researcher, that is E.Y. Um, Welland. And uh, this was a European, indeed, who went on and tried 
to gather information about oil and the different explorations or the seepages that are within the grabbing or what we call the greater Albertine region that is in the Western Lake Valley of uh, East Africa. So preferably, I'm going to give an overview, a history, historical background about the oil and gas industry in Uganda. Um, to be more specific, we are talking about all the seepages, all the exploration, and how it came up. But we have to be very sure, and we have to be conk, and exactly know where and which exact position are we talking about. We are talking about the Albertine region, which is Lake Albert, which borders Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. As I told you earlier, that first it was, an, it was a European who came up with a, a little bit of research about the same. But later on, we are seeing in 1930, more discoveries are made. And the first, at least, well, deep well was drilled. That is Waki one, and that was uh, in those districts of Butiaba, in a uh, district of Hoima in the Butiaba region. What is it about? It was about seeing and exploring and knowing that now there is oil in this region. Furthermore, if you draw your attention to the year 1945 to 1980, we are seeing the World War setting in. Which World War II setting in? It now had to put the development um, of the oil and gas industry at a stake. Why? Now, the colonialists had to change because now Uganda was taken as at least a food hub rather than anything else or to mine the minerals. And uh, then the Niger or the West Africa was taken on for the mineralization and extraction of very many things other than minerals, but also other economic things that were made there. Uh, preferably, we'll go on and move to uh, 2003. 2003, we are seeing more wells being discovered, which more wells are now, at, um, most of them were a little shallow, but then people went on to do on and uh, drill them. But uh, before maybe we went to 2003, we can draw back to when Seven sets in, that is immediately after Obote too. We are seeing that now he brings in policies that have to at least uplift the oil and gas industry. Um, which policies? He's now strategizing capacity building within the oil and gas industry. So he's giving it a boost. So now the boost comes in around 1980 up to around 2003. We are now strategizing and we are seeing how many companies are now coming in, which companies are getting interested. This is when we always see Turo Energies getting interested in the oil and gas industry in Uganda and coming in and doing more what we call aeromagnetic uh, survey or exploration where we found out more wells around the grabbing. We moved on to around 2006, 2008, the commercialization. Now, more industries come on, such as uh, Senok and also Total, EP. So Total EP is different from the Total we see usually. Mm -hmm. Total EP is uh, majorly the one uh, for exploration and production, right? Yeah. And uh, this Total and the other companies are now urging to come and invest in the oil and gas industry in Uganda, to explore, to extract, and also make up backup agreements that at least will benefit the nation as they're also getting some profit. Moving on the same lane, we are seeing more laws that are being created in order to govern and make sure that this oil is extracted well. You know, Ugandans were very different at times. Rumors were set far back around 2006, 7, 8, 19, that the oil had already started, uh, the, the, uh, had already started, you know, moving on and being cheated. But I can assure you that that is not right because our oil is too heavy, to the extent that it's like shoe polish. So I don't think there is any, any, any vehicle that can carry that. Well, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a manufacturer, but depending on my research, we need a pipeline, and it's going to be one of the most heated up pipeline in the rest of the world. Still on the history. We are seeing the commercialization, as I told you, around 2006 and 2008. What does it come up with? It comes up with different physical and valuable terms that will benefit the country as well as the, country, as well as the companies that want to invest in the oil and gas industry within Uganda. So we are moving right away from, uh, we are moving uh, from the first stream, at least to the middle stream, to the development part of it. To the midstream. Yeah, to the midstream to the development part 
of the of a of the oil and gas industry. Now we are starting to see developments coming up. Which developments? We are seeing companies shining in order to construct roads leading to Hoima, which Hoima is now, I think, the oil city, if I'm not mistaken. We are seeing uh, construction companies setting up uh, Kabari International Airport, but majorly because of the what? Of the oil. We are seeing that people now are being compensated so as to, to, to make way for the a pipeline. All these are coming to the development from around 2008 to date. Well, people are saying there is devaluation. Others are saying, you know what, there is influx of the population. But all this draws to the history. How are people feeling? How is it developing? When we move on the same issue, we are looking at uh, <clears throat> after these companies are being licensed and are also carrying on, we are seeing now to the final investment uh, plan which is now being signed in between Uganda and Tanzania. Why? Uganda is a landlocked country. Yeah, and other oil companies. Uganda is a landlocked country. So there is no way we can construct a refinery here, scientifically. Right? No. Do you sure? Do you know why I'm saying that? We have lakes, we have everything, but to the best of my knowledge, I've never seen a refinery on a lake. Well, why I'm asking is because mm. it's something that... We it's it's something that we have been fronting mm. that we need to build the refinery in Uganda. Yes. True, we have been fronting the same, but do we have the capacity? Well, that is a question of fact, okay. rather than a point of discussion here, yeah. because uh, as I've told as I've told you, we are in the in the financial investment plan. We are seeing Tanzania and Uganda and the oil companies coming up with uh, different agreements in order to construct the pipeline the East African oil pipeline, that is ECOP, from right here from uh, Kavali in Hoima to Tanga, where the refinery will be constructed. As well, there are also Italian and uh, Britain and French companies that are trying to, uh, that are uh, being constructed in order to do what? To construct the refinery and other infrastructure that indeed will help in the development and also help Uganda to earn something from their oil. Okay. So, setting right here from 1925 to date, it has not been smooth. We had an impediment that is in around 1945 when the World War II sets in. Yeah. yeah. Later on. It started in 1939. True, true. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you move on the lane, we're also having different issues of some people calling the Ugandan national oil their oil, which brings in some ruckus in Parliament also. Why do you call the nationalist oil our oil? Remember. We didn't have any course as per then that was talking or that was being taught about oil. So even the employment bit and um, uh, the, you know uh, the human resource had to be sourced out in order to be brought here. So we had a lot of impediments in the history. But well, I'm very sure after all this ruckus of ECOP and EU sanctions gets done, we shall benefit, although with a cost. Okay. We will get back to you on that cost. So, <laughs> <Thank> you <very much. laughs> yeah. So let me bring Pauline into the discussion. So Fred has looked at the historical um, overview of the oil sector in Uganda. So for you, Pauline, what is the current status of the oil uh, sector in Uganda now that we're in 2022? Okay. Thank you, moderator. Um, Speaking of the current status of the oil in Uganda, uh, like Fred has put it, the commercial, the, the, oh, the commercial oil deposits were, this were confirmed in 2006. That was the 6.5 billion barrels that were confirmed. However, in 2013, we see the ECOP coming up and informing informing the state that all the 6.5 billion barrels cannot be commercially cannot be commercially recoverable and the only oil deposits that can be commercially recoverable are 1.4 billion barrels and therefore what we see what the oil, the oil that can bring back breaking this down the only oil we can extract for us to bring to recover the finances that we have we've been, we have invested in the oil are only 1.4 billion barrels and moving on we see the the government setting up an action plan an action plan on how to extract 
this oil. And this is the plant that, that brings in the exploration, the production, and also the transportation or the, the transportation and also delivery to the customers. And in this, this is and in this plan, this is where we see the government looking on how will this oil be extracted, how will this oil reach the final consumers, and who are our target consumers. And it is through this that we see the government coming up with a project that is the eco project that it is together with other oil companies breaking them down together with other oil companies that is the total energies with the biggest shares in the eco and when i talk about the eco what do i mean I, when i talk about the eco the eco sorry when i talk about the eco i mean the means of the ones we could call the means of transportation as we all know that uganda is a landlocked country we can know if we produce our oil here, there is no way it's going to be shipped to the what? To our to the major consumers, as we all know that USA is the major consumer of oil or of petroleum products. And after the production, the, after the plan, after the discovery of the oil, Uganda has to, to look on had to look on how will this oil reach the major consumer. And this is how the eco project came up with total and to, 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 total with the biggest shares of 62%, Sinok with the least shares, that is 8%, Unok, that is the Uganda National Oil Corporation, with 15%, Tanzania, which is our partner, with 15%. And how did this come up? We see this in April, uh, April where Uganda signed agreements with all these, with all these companies, the oil companies, together with the, what? with the partner country, that is Tanzania. We, they signed the Tanzania agreement. They also signed the shareholders agreement and other two agreements that were signed on in the same month of April. That is 2022, this year. And we, we've I've, reaching there, I think I've rushed. We can break down back to first Feb, where the eco, plot, the eco project was launched. That this is how you, this is why Uganda broke it down and showed us how Ugandans are going to benefit. The dif different articles were written on the ECOP and different concerns have been risen against ECOP and other supporting ECOP. I would say that ECOP project has actually broken down, separate, divided Ugandans as always. And this is the status of the oil currently in Uganda. Currently, the status of oil is we are still in the upper stream where the oil is still under the exploration act it has it was already explored that is by the tala by the tola oil industry it tallow tal oil industry sorry it was already exp it was the exploration part was done and now we are looking at the production and the transportation or delivery and that we are partially in the midstream where we have seen developments, the developments in the oil city that is Hoima, we've seen the airport is almost 70% complete. We have the petroleum school that has been constructed, that it is an institution in, still in Hoima. And we also have, we, we are also looking, we've also seen the roads have been developed. So I would say the status of the oil currently in Uganda is that it is, we are still in the upper stream but partially moving towards the midstream okay thank you okay thank you so much pauline for giving us the current status of the oil sector and uh, as well as uh, showing us how prepared uganda is for the oil let me move and bring macklin into the discussion so macklin this is a sector that is described as um there's a lot of investment and money being put into the oil sector by all the parties. And my question to you is, how prepared is Uganda legally, the legal framework uh, that Uganda has put up in place to prepare for this oil? Um, thank you so much, Mrs. Madreta. Um, on the legal bit of it, uh, the legal part of it, um, Uganda has signed agreements with various countries. These agreements are both international and domestic. By international, I mean it has signed with it has signed agreements with countries out, and domestic those are on 
maybe legal acts that are being put in place, uh, such things. So allow me to begin with the international bit of it. Uh, first of all, Uganda is a landlocked country that we all know. So there is no way Uganda can uh, transport its oil freely. So by that, Uganda had to seek consent from Tanzania. Remember, Tanzania is our partner. We all have 15, 15%. So Uganda had to seek consent from Tanzania, of which Tanzania accepted. And when Tanzania accepted, uh, that led to an agreement, the intergovernmental agreement. What was the essence of the agreement? Uh, this agreement was to harmonize all countries, like in, 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 in areas of rights, land, standards. You all have to have eco, eco standards. You know, the fact that they have consented, you know, they may turn against us, but this contract, you know, <laughs> the reason I say they put legal, legal frameworks is to make parties binding to their agreements. So there is no way you can turn against anything. So they had to, to put that agreement. Fact that Uganda is being landlocked, so we had to get an outlet through Tang and we had to sign an agreement with Tanzania. Um, secondly, we have the most recent agreements. Uh, those are the agreements between um, Uganda and ECOP. Uh, Uganda and ECOP, Tanzania and ECOP. Those ones were signed, I think, in May, in April, yeah, in April 2022. Those are the most recent ones that have been signed. Uh, we have the tariff and transportation agreements. And we have the East African Special Provisions Act that specifies given things. Now, this one, the Eastern, the East, that East African Act, its essence, you know, we have acts in, we have acts in Tanzania. Now, the essence of this joint one is uh, to make sure that the provisions that are not in our domestic acts, it has them. So, so it's to harmonize. Harmonize, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is to harmonize both countries. So I come to the, to the domestic bit of it, our domestic parts, our Uganda. Uh, we have the Water Act. If you're to, to, to draw attention back, you realize uh, the pipeline is going to be passing through various water bodies, the Victoria Basins, um, River Chivale, very many, River Kachanga. So we have to get uh, the, the, the essence of this act is uh, to facilitate for all that, the water provisions. Uh, and then we have the National Environmental Act. Uh, that one specifically deals with the environment, right to nature, and basically section three and I think four of that act, they talk about our right to land and the right to, to have the nature. And um, we have the, the Petroleum Waste Management Act, um, the Petroleum Exploration and Development Act that was enacted in 2013. Uh, the Refining Conversion Transmission and Midstream Storage Act. And the essence of this one is it's a legal foundation and de uh, development of refineries and other midstream infrastructures. Like it's to bring all that mid midstream thing out, the development process out. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, McQueen. Before I bring Bosco into the discussion, I just have one more question for you. So looking at the legal framework that you brought out, would mm -hmm. you say Uganda is legally prepared enough for the, for the coming of the oil? Yes, according to me, I believe it is legally prepared because it not only has the acts or the legal bindings, but it has also come up with institutions to, to make its bond stronger, you don't have to be prepared for something. So that is what Uganda is trying to do. It's doing all its best to make sure by the time everything starts, they are ready. At least they have done their best. You know, you can't be 100% uh, prepared, even if you want, even if you repeat. You know, we begin a semester at the beginning of the semester. We have all that time, but we, 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 you get to an exam and... You still haven't gotten prepared 100% and you know, prepared, but not 100%. Mm. Yeah, so that is it with Uganda. Uganda has come up with uh, the POW, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, uh, the Petroleum Foundation, the Enoch is there for us. So to me, I think it is very prepared. It is doing its best. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bro, do you have something to add? Oh, well, I was looking at an assessment of the legal framework and uh, I'm informed. I'm informed. If I'm to add anything, I'll spoil the soup. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, before Fre mm. Fred spoils the soup, let me bring Bosco into the discussion. So, Bosco, I basically have two questions for you, but I would like to start with the first one that I asked McQueen. Your perspective, do you think Uganda is prepared for the extraction of oil? Uh, Not you. just extraction of oil, the oil sector, is it prepared at the moment? Thank you very much. Just before I answer the question, I uh, usually love to be referred to as Lemmy. When you refer to me as Bosco, I think about the other gentleman who who was my empty That is funny. Okay. So, um, back to the question. Uganda, we are in this uh, we are in this state of euphoria whereby we think we are ready for this activity, and I can vividly tell Ugandans out there and anyone on this panel that uh, we are not ready for this. We are excited. We are <laughs> jumping. We are. We are, I mean, we're having this sugar height yeah. that is making us feel like uh, we are ready for this activity. By uh, just, um, my colleague has stated all the legal framework, which Fred did not want to spoil, but I really want to know what Fred has to say later on. However, in my own opinion, I think Uganda needs to sit down and really understand what actually this oil thing is. We should not just uh, dive into it. Well, someone is going to say, I mean, we've been looking at this for almost a century, since 1925 to yeah. 2022. Uh, yeah. um, you know, countries like Nigeria, countries like Libya, countries like uh, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, all the countries in the, United, uh, in, uh, in the United Emirates and all that stuff, these countries have had these oil things for a lifetime. And uh, they have built these refineries, the economies lie on them. I mean, we Ugandans, even our coat of arms clearly shows uh, we're having cotton, we're having an antelope, we, we, we are having, I don't know if it's tea or it's grass. <laughs> and and, and we should, I think cassava of lead should be added to the coat of arms. Yeah. <laughs> in, 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 remember in primary, we learned all those things on the coat of arms. Um, so, yeah. And uh, I remember we learned that, that the backbone of Uganda's economy is uh, agriculture. And I really think it will be so sad that uh, we are spending so much money on uh, this oil thing when we're not ready for it. It's simply a wrong step that we should not take. Okay, uh, let me. Yes, let, uh, me. let me. Let me use that name yes, since it's your preferred name. Why do you say we are not ready? One, we are not ready because um, we call it our oil and we're having 15%. Does it make sense to anyone that it's 15% and it's our oil? That is in Iacop. Not only in Iacop, um, even uh, the agreements that are signed. These people have signed agreements whereby uh, we cannot finance it ourselves. When we cannot finance something, we end up borrowing extremely largely. Earlier on, I was sharing with my colleague that uh, every Ugandan is born with a debt. Every Ugandan living is having a debt. Till when are we going to keep on increasing the debt burden on each and every Ugandan? We are not ready because we cannot finance it. That's one of the reasons that we are not ready. Secondly, I don't think we've had extensive research into understanding in detail as to what legal framework is necessary for us to begin running these uh, oil activities. No wonder the EU came up to criticize the human rights abuses, the environmental degradation and all that. It's because we are barely acting uh, from a point of ignorance with smiles on our faces as though we are informed and as though we are working out these things. But at the end of the day, one thing I'm quite accomplished with is that we are not ready for it and it will take us another much more longer time. We also don't have the labor. We are importing Chinese, we are importing uh, Europeans, we are importing uh, all kinds of people to come and work on our oil. Of what benefit is this going to be to me, to you? We are not ready at all. Let us send children to school. Every person who does physics and mathematics and passes well, go and study oil and gas. Five years later, you will come back. We shall be ready then. As of now, we're not ready. We need some more time. Okay. Madam Thank you. Hello. Thank you. I see. I see. I see. Fred. I see. I see. Fred wants to contradict. Fred. And Pauline. Pauline wants to support. So let me start with Fred. Uh, preferably, if you say we're not ready for for the oil production and everything, uh, the first question would be, what is business, and what is risk in business? Two. <coughs> Can you get a solution to a problem that is not existing? Three, 
the burden, the, the, the dead burden is still going what? High, even without oil. Yes? Uh, looking at the corruption within the nation, you know, they always borrow and end up not knowing the what? The can, budget. How can I ask Fred one question? Way, no, 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 let's just let Fred finish you know, his statement. They end up borrowing large sums of money and we don't know where the money goes. Uh -huh. You know, That's they tell us they are selected and uh, very hidden budgets that we cannot know about. You know, you, you look at a queue of tanks from the border of Tanzania to the Ugandan border and it's being brought here. Why can't we risk and borrow and invest in our what? In our in, in, in the oil production, leave alone that as you stated it well oh, that we oh, don't yeah. need. I, I'm seeing that we don't even need to do what to borrow because I know agreements lapse with time, isn't it? Yes, it is. yes, these companies can invest, and after investing, when we start production, they will get out their investment capital and we shall stay with our oil because it is there to stay. You know, very many wells are being discovered day by day, the airport is being built. Well, we might. Uh, we might not have those, you know, strong technicians, but well, there are people in that region, in the Graben region, that are benefiting from this. You know, we cannot take on every chance, because Remy, you are studying law. Are you aware that, like it or not, a legal course regarding oil has to come up? Now, are you going to are, are you going to now wait and study five years, then you come and apply it? Where are you going to apply it? Let the industry start. And then we can constitute the human resource. Because now, as you say, as uh, well, Macklin stated, that we have now a petroleum school there. Yeah. Now, would that petroleum school go, which people, people should not just go there for the sake, but they should go there and knowing that immediately after here, employment is there. Mr. Alimi Frank, I don't want you to put your nation yeah. below your feet. I want you to focus on your nation as your mother. You, you know, okay. Okay. first place. First place. Okay. Let, 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 let's first finish. <laughs> this gentleman resembles one of the wisest men in Uganda. That is Obote. Because of the hairstyle and skin <laughs> I bet you wise to that uh, extent. Because I'm seeing you're not frotting the nation. We cannot, we cannot look at the debt burden, but now we have to look at the risk of how we can recover the debt. What? You well stated it. Every child is born with one point something debt. Hmm? Should we let it increase or let us risk some funds and putting off part of the contract such that we can compensate? Okay. Uh, <laughs> before before, before mm. Lemmy comes in, let's have Pauline who has been waiting. Yeah, um, I like the conversation, first of all. Like, Fred has actually made my work easy. He first brought out the, the corruption bit of the country. He brought he has, he has shown us how our funds have been mismanaged. And the same government that has been mismanaging our funds is the same government that is going to manage our revenue from the oil. Let's leave that out. Macklin talked about the institutions. We've had various institutions in, cha in charge of various projects. We've had several projects. We've seen the coffee projects. We've, we've had various projects that the government has always brought in, saying that this project is going to eradicate poverty in Uganda. But where are those projects? And in all those projects, we've risked funds in them. The government has put the taxpayers' money in, that, in those projects. The government has risked the taxpayers' money on the disguise of, we are taking a risk. Fred talked about business, that the, we have to believe in the risks of government. Haven't we seen enough risks in Uganda? Haven't we taken up enough risks? If the money that, if this money that is going to be invested in the ear cop, if this money is put up, at least and they set up a coffee processing industry in Uganda. We have a lot of coffee being produced in Uganda. Okay, let, and me, let me just ask Pauline one question. So, Pauline, you're saying the money should be put into coffee processing. Um, so, no, 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 no. My question here comes. Okay. What do we do with the oil discovery? We pretend we didn't see it. The, my, my point on that is putting the money, I, didn't, I mentioned coffee to represent agriculture. The money, be, I talked, I meant the money being diverted into agriculture. What do we do with the oil? To, for the purpose of oil, we are all looking at the profits, the two billions that we expect to get out of this oil project, the two billions per year, we are expecting to get out of the of someone's oil. The person who always claims it's my oil. So we are expecting to get these two billions, where but we are not even sure how these two billions are going to be done, what to be used. And the other thing, we are holding the profits we are going to get out of the air corp at the cost 
of our environment, at the cost of our climate, at the cost of human rights, of the people of Uganda. We are holding the profits we're going to get from Iacob. And now what do I say? What do we do with the oil? For me, the oil has been silent and we can let it be silent and proceed with other projects. That can develop Uganda. So and one of them is that no, 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 and from wherever we've reached, where Uganda is, it's because of agriculture. There is no doubt on that. And agriculture and tourism. Those the tourist attractions are being destroyed in the construction of the airport. Moderator, okay. Should I, uh, I have a single oh, question? No, 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 no. Let's inspire. Uh, Alia, no, Alia. Alia. Stand, no, no, no. put all our eggs in one basket. <laughs> yes. Eh? Which is in impossible. one basket. What if that basket falls? That is one. Then two. Pauline, oil, agriculture. These are two activities that can supplement each other. Let yes, us get out of the agriculture. Of we support the oil. Then later on, we shall get from the oil and make our agriculture great. We are still yeah, using hand holes. Yeah. Why don't now. we use the oil and get tractors? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mod moderator. <laughs> I, uh, yes. Let's, hmm? let's have, let's have uh, Lenny. And then I see McLean has also been interjecting. Then we close <laughs> <laughs> that discussion Actually, and move now, on. <laughs> first of all, I want to react to Fred's earlier submission before we proceed. Uh, Uganda is a nation that uh, has been under one solemn family for over 35 plus years. And um, we have had a history of... Uh, and Britain, how many centuries? We, let's we, let's, we, let's we, have... We, let me finish. We have had a history <laughs> of uh, gross corruption throughout. We have had a history of people not only stealing money, people not only are taking uh, what doesn't belong to them, but uh, in the Bible, they say give what belongs to Caesar to Caesar. But uh, on social media, you see memes, people saying, me taking what belongs to Caesar. That is exactly what's happening in Uganda. Yeah. <laughs> in Uganda right now, we, as a, first of all, I agree that uh, the oil is one of the beautiful ventures. We can't rely on agriculture alone because uh, we're not uh, sure about the rains. However, oil is a more stable investment that can keep running forever. But as of now, we are not ready to have this investment planted in a country like Uganda yeah. because these finances are going to be sprinkled onto uh, a particular class of people, a particular group of people that uh, are going to do the same things they've always done with the national finances, build their luxurious homes, have, have 10 V8 cars, drive their children driving to school with uh, Mercedes Benzes, all kinds of luxury. So... I believe it will be too early for a country like Uganda to dive into this kind of thing. It is better for us to study and understand what are we getting ourselves into before we actually dive into it. Okay, let me, let me just ask uh, let me one question in that respect. The commercial oil discovery was in 2006. Yes. But before that, we saw seepages of oil as far as 1920. Yes. Don't you think we have studied enough? Do we need more time to study um, the oil? By the mere fact that we are still importing labor, by the mere fact that the Oil and Gas Act was drafted in 2020, by the mere fact that uh, we have no refinery, by the mere fact that uh, we have just signed the final investment decision, by the mere fact that uh, we had never thought about a pipeline before until 2020, by the mere fact that uh, people have not yet been compensated fully on the land that has been taken, by the mere fact that... Uh, I mean, all this has happened and these are just patches to one single art piece that is showing incompetency, that is showing lack of ability, that is showing, uh, I mean, we are like lame people trying to jump on, uh, on, one, on, I mean, on a race of 100 meters where we are running with Usain Bolt and you are lame. Are you, okay. going to, are you going to in any way <laughs> beat Usain Bolt? We, we, we cannot do this. This is uh, a total sabotage. To the country's uh, economy and I don't think it will be the rightful decision for us to dive into this kind of thing at this particular point of time. Okay, let, let Macklin conclude on that and then we move to something else. Thank you. Um, to add on what you've said, you asked him a question that first of all, we, the first discovery was in the 1920s. The, co the, the commercialization was in 2006. Those are all years. 
um, the agreements are being signed in 2020, 2021. So what time do you want us to do? Do you want us to have our oil in 2040? No, that can't be. At least now that we have an act, we can import the labor. As we teach the young generation, there's already an institution uh, in Chigumba. We can teach them what to do as these people are, are working. So that in case you're saying they, they first go and study PEM and then when they pass, they go automatically. Let them study. Like, let, let me say these ones that are going to do their exams next week, but one. Those doing PEM, they go straight to the oil and gas sector, knowing that when they finish, they'll still find something. Uh, and and it's, it's not good that we wait. It's not good. If, if we have a chance, we have to use it now. This is the time. This is the time we have to. To, to, you have to take a risk. A business person is a risk taker. If you fear risks, then I don't know. Cannot you, go, you, 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 say, you you have to you have to take a step ahead and you say, okay, I'm going for this, but let me see that. Oh, you have to you have to have a positive mind. You know, and okay. no, positivity. No, no, fancy. No, he's suggesting that we should fail to start, we, we, and we, failing we. to start is failure to even win a single penny. No, every journey starts with a single step. Yes. Yes. He's Positivity. suggesting we should not. Let me, let me Every single journey. Okay, After, let's, let's, let's <laughs> leave. <laughs> let's leave back in. Let's leave back in to finish. Have come in 2020. Yes, we have an act now. They'll find it in place. They'll have where to start from. It's not like they're beginning from zero. True. You know? They're beginning from something. You know, if it was maybe like in 2006 where we have nothing, we have no act, we have no legal legal frameworks yeah, then, but now we have something if, let us give it a try or we, you're saying it's agriculture agriculture is our backbone yes i believe that okay but thank you, thank you. Macklin, Macklin, can i just conc react to no, Macklin? Macklin concluded <laughs> on just, that aspect in the spirit of moving forward I was, in the spirit of moving forward okay. i'll start right from here with a friend so, Fred, what are the expectations of Ugandans when it comes to oil? Because we are seated here discussing legal framework and discoveries and so forth. The Ugandans, we have seen their excitement with the final investment decision. What are their expectations? Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, ranging from 1906 to, uh, to the current year, that is 2022, there are over 116 years, Mr. Remy. I thought we were moving forward. I, yeah, yeah, we are moving forward. <laughs> I like the way he's shooting at me. <laughs> First and foremost, we are, we are ready mm. for the oil. We are okay. ready. If it is pregnancy, just two days to be back. Now, what are Ugandans expecting is the question at hand. Whenever your wife is pregnant, you can never expect a dead baby. They are all happy and excited about the positive outcomes that are coming with exploration, production, and the final investment plan. First and foremost, they are looking at the economic uplift. How? We are having very many sectors. Our budget is 51, almost 51% from donations and loans and everywhere. Now these people are expecting an economic uplift from this oil that now we are going to be able to at least earn over two billion US dollars per annum. You get it? So they expect that many are going to be employed in the sector, whether as those technicians or these lay workers. You no, know, the airport is coming up, but it's coming up because of the oil, Kavan International Airport. We are going to have we already, we already have aviation schools here. It means more people are going to get jobs. Cleaners. Madam moderator. Please tap on Fred. He's having this phantomagoria. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave Fred to finish. <laughs> I don't think he's you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, awake. <laughs> you know, I'm a mommy's boy. She always tells me one thing. Act till you make it. Act till you make it. Meaning, before you're a student lawyer, if you are not one, I would be expecting you to be putting on maybe a T-shirt and sandals. You get it? But you are forging a way out till you make it. So we are going to forge a way out till we do what? We make mm -hmm. it. First, okay. I was talking about the employment, the economic uplift. Two, we are looking at the infrastructure movement, which we have already now experienced and got to see. We are seeing, tama, you know, roads well constructed. From right out from Hoima to the border of Tanzania, linking us to Tanga. 
We are seeing these feeder roads also being done well. We are seeing schools being set up, the infrastructure development. People are expectant about the same. Three, we are looking at oil uplifting the rest of the, the, the rest of the, uh, the rest of our sources of money, like agriculture. When we get money from there, then we can reinvest and boost the agriculture. You get it? Because people are still using hand holes. People are still using, you know, people now are still believing that to get massive production, you need an acre. But because of the new technologies, we no longer need that. But why is it not put here? Investment. Money for sensitization. All those policies need money. And people are looking at this oil money that is going to bust everything in the economy. Okay. Right? Now, moving on to the last thing, the social bit of it. And also the improving the international relationship, you know, between Uganda and the rest of the nations. Uganda and the rest of the nations, for example, we are seeing now the agreement between Tanzania and Uganda. Are you seeing the same? Between Uganda and Tanzania, this agreement is creating more friendship relations with us. We are seeing two energies coming right away from Britain, coming to Uganda, another bond. Total, from France and other countries, another bond. Are you seeing how our international relations are growing broad? Okay. Leave alone that. We are seeing beer on Twitter. Every time tweeting, you know, some tweets and uh, all, and the father. Who is beer? Well, <laughs> let's move on. I know, I know the viewers know the person. <laughs> they are tweeting about our oil as their oil. But Robert Mugabe spent 90 years, by, by the time he was president, at least he went to his 90s. At yes. He died. He left, and right now the state is being learned by another what? It is a matter of time. We shall not complain about corruption. It is a matter of time. Which matter of time? I know with what I've laid that Ugandans are expecting the economic uplift, the social uplift, the infrastructure uplift. Mm -hmm. Mainly those three points. They cannot be contented by God is by God is will. One day, the regime you are saying that is too corrupt will go. Okay. But One day. Uh, Bia please. and the father will go and uh, the father will feed Bia. him from any other <laughs> okay. country. Moderator, just, a, just one interjection. Okay. Uh, Fred is a, a saying, uh, he has spoken a lot. However, all Fred has said is, I can summarize into one, one simple thing. We are simply digging a hole to fill another hole. That is what yeah. Uganda is doing at this point of time. When you say we expected $2 billion every year, how much have we put in? I mean, how much have we put in as of now? And out of all this money we have put into this investment, where has, has it come from? Has it come from the pockets of Ugandans? Has it come from foreigners? I can assure you it has come from foreigners. None. A little, very, very insignificantly little has come from Ugandans. And if it has come from Ugandans, it's from the few very prominent rich Ugandans. Not even, not even the national uh f like the national accounts and all that stuff so when we see all that happening and uh, someone tells me we shall the, the regime of beer and his father will come to an end are we going to promote immorality in society because we are optimistic of one okay. day things coming to a change the question is will you allow rape to continue defilement to continue in society Activity because you day. hope that someday the rapists and defilers will die. <laughs> okay. So Does right it? right from that angle, we are taking a short break and we'll still come back with the same discussion on the oil prospects in Uganda. Thank you. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others.
The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when... Welcome back from that short break. We are still with students of Islamic University in Uganda and we are discussing oil prospects, how the oil sector is going to solve the social economic challenges in Uganda. So coming back from the break, uh, let me start with Pauline. So, Pauline, we have seen the EU decision and we have seen hashtags that have been running on Twitter and protests and several other issues um, where it's being alleged that there are human rights and environmental issues uh, connected to the oil sector mm -hmm. in Uganda. So, my question to you is, what are some of those issues that have come up? Thank you, moderator. Yeah, we've, on the 15th of September this year, we saw the EU coming up with different resolutions on the, about the human rights abuses, the environmental abuses that are going on in Uganda due to the ECOP. And fine, would say maybe it was wrong for the ECOP, sorry, for the EU to come up and invade itself or engage itself into the issues that are concerning Uganda. But we are Ugandans. We are Ugandans and we are seeing what is happening in Uganda. We are seeing what is really happening in, happening in our country. Were these, were these resolutions wrong? Were these allegations wrong? We have the, one of the issues they rose in their concern was the human rights abuse. And to the, according to different reporters, that these human rights abuse are actually going on in, the, in those regions and those districts where the ECOP is settled, where the ECOP is planning, where the, planning to, the, where the pipeline is going to pass. We've seen that the government has acquired over 2,000 acres of land. Do you want to tell the, the country that all these 2,000 acres of land have been vacant? The, 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 the pipeline is going to cover over 1,443 kilometers, that is from Hoima to Tanga. Okay, then we, we as Ugandans, we, we, know, we know that Uganda has been facing a lot of human rights abuses and breaking them down on the land that has been acquired. Have these people been compensated, fully compensated? Early this year, that was in May, the, the managing director of the ECOP came up and told us that 41% of these people the 41% of the pups have been compensated. However, according to different civil societies and, uh, and, and other reporters that I can break down, that is the, I can, uh, that is the independence, Uganda, Uganda, independence, Uganda on social media. It also, it made an assessment. They found out that the people in these areas are being threatened. They're being made to sign different documents that, that, that they don't even take an opportunity to read through. These are threats to these people. These people are not allowed to express themselves freely. We are seeing the right freedom of expression being abused. We saw that the, the students that were the students that were demonstrating in support supporting the eco. These students actually demonstrated with the police, and the students that were demonstrating against the eco. These students were arrested by the police. That means in Uganda that we don't have the freedom of expression. Our right is abused. In this same project, we come and break down to the right to personal property. The, the people, uh, accord, oh, it is of recent, that is on 15th September, as the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, that is Thomas Taewa, when he was responding, when he was reading out a letter of the EU resolutions to the Parliament of Uganda, he stated that 70% of the PAPs, that is the persons affected by the project, the pipeline project, that have been compensated. How about the 30%? Where are these 30% left? 
we we all these lives matter and before the government before the government had kick starting the project or before the government evicting these people from their lands the first thing that had, was supposed to be drawn was the plan on how these people's lives are going to be done what to be impacted so we, here we see the right to livelihood the right to life being abused then we look at the right to food the right to food most of the people in these areas depend on agriculture they grow food for personal for 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 eat they grow food for eating they grow food for sale they depend on subsistence farming and if their land is being taken away it doesn't matter how big the land is even if it is just one acre of land if this land is taken away from this person where do you expect these people to get the food so we see the right to food being abused here we see the right to food if someone denies you food they have actually denied you what life and this this one was elaborated more by the judiciary by the courts of Uganda in the case of Salvatore Abuki versus AG Attorney General. And come breaking down, we see the the compensation, the levels of compensation. This thirty percent that has not yet been compensated really matter. These people need to be compensated. So breaking down the human, then the environmental issues, the environmental issues in of recent that, that is in two thousand twenty two thousand nineteen the. Paris Agreement was signed where they, they informed the world that if the global warming of the world is just increased by just 1%, the world's climate will be at stake. But however, Uganda is choosing profits over that. It's choosing profits over our climate. We break down to the environment, the ecosystem. The ecosystem is being destroyed as they construct the pipeline. The, when we talk about the, the ecosystem, we not only consider the world, the people, we also look at the world animals, both the vertebrates and the invertebrates, those the organisms that form our fertile soils, they are being destroyed. The government is saying that, however, after, bar, after constructing the pipeline, it's going to be buried at least two meters below the ground, and other activities are going to, to take part. How long will it take for the forests that have been cut down, for the animals that will have moved away, distortion of wildlife, how are they going to come up? It is going to pass through different water bodies. How, how, is, the aqua, uh, how is the aqua life protected? And in case of any leakages, we've seen how the government responds to issues. In case of any leakages, how sure are we that the government will respond immediately before the 40 million people that depend on, the Victoria, on Lake Victoria, we know the pipeline passes through the Victoria Basin, how, are, how, do, how sure are we that it is going to respond immediately? We know our country and we know how slow it is. And still on the environment, the issue of, of the environment, we are not forgetting the, the wildlife. I think I'm, I've repeated that. But literally, those are the environmental and the human rights issues that are affecting Uganda due to the AirCo project. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, Pauline. Let me move to Macklin. So, Macklin, what is your perspective of the environment and the alleged environmental and human rights issues um, connected to IACOP, and uh, how is the government uh, responding to such issues? Thank you so much. Uh, as my co-panelist has been saying, she has talked of different rights being violated, and most of them are even just hearsays. And yes, you've talked about the land, the compensation, uh, the environment, on the side of the environmental part, you've said there's global warming and the water is being spoiled. You talked about the pipeline. And of course, the, um, when, 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 when the EU came up in September, these are the, the very issues it came up with, uh, that the eco, the eco project is... Uh, is going to, 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 to degrade the environment uh, in, in, in form of global emissions. But then uh, ECOP is doing something, in, uh, and Uganda is also doing something. Uh, as regards to the land, we, we all have a right to land. Um, we have a right on the surface, up in the surface and below the surface. But it is limited. If it is... Above the surface and below the surface and down, it is okay. But it depends. How does it depend? If we have minerals below, then you're entitled to the space, this upper space and the upper space. So what am I trying to tell you is that uh, the government has gone on to take its position. Um, about the, la the land, the government is compensating those people. You've all said it that uh, the right honorable speaker, 
uh, Mr. Taiwa talked about it. Uh, and he said 70% is being compensated. Yes, the 30% that has not yet been compensated, uh, those are the people that uh, have problems with the verifications of maybe their documents. Um, others have their own myths or traditional myths. You know, uh, since time immemorial, the very people, uh, that's even where the, the Europeans got the most of the resistance from. So those people are kind of, you know, some people are just, you know, that is what I'm talking about. Does it mean that those ones? No, are you saying no. Are has never changed when it comes to resistance? No, let, no, <laughs> no, let's no, no, that is their nature. That, that is, is their nature. nature. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then you can change. Yes, think. and they're being compensated. The government has gotten acres of land to compensate them in, in which place? In some place called Chaka, Chaka or something like that. It is getting the land to compensate them. The government is going to build schools for them. It is going to renovate their health centers, the Kavale Health Center. That is fighting for their health. Do you have to take my oil to build schools for me? Uh, uh, no, they, they are compensating them. In, okay, so, <coughs> that is fine. We are talking mm. about Macri, the effects finish. of the ECO mm. on, on, on the people. So I'm also telling you what the government is doing for them. Mm. You know, it has already happened and they are also looking into it. Then the government also has um, the ESIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment plan uh that that one is uh, it, it is really based on all of us uh, the people there the the, the, gov plan? the government uh, officials um then, then the, 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 those experts it has engaged all of them to make sure that what they are doing is to to the standards to the international standards they are trying to to look into everything that may distort the environment. If it's about the environment, they go and ask people on the ground, what is this and this? How should we do this? And they're engaging all the people through that impact assessment plan. Uh, then about, you, you talked about the, 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 the students uh, who, who, who are protesting. protesting. You find that people in that very same area in Hoima, almost two schools, came protesting that they should leave their oil. People, if they are proud of their oil for crying out loud, why should you interfere? If, if, if they are feeling comfortable, they are the ones that are feeling the heat. But if they are feeling comfortable with the heat, they know, they know the impact there, they know what is happening. If, if they are supporting it, then why go against it? Can I ask you a question? Let Martin finish. You are, you are, allow, coming, you are, you are coming to you. You allow me to come to... Uh, to no, 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 no. Let Martin finish. Seriously. I just want to ask her one Let's question. Let's so finish, then you ask your question. question. Mm. Then about uh, the global warming, you talked about global warming. Is it Uganda going to be the first? Is Uganda going to be the first <laughs> country to do that? You know, it is you not going to risk. It, 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 it countries. The, the the best pollutant in China is that it produces over two million barrels a day. Carbon. Uganda, you, you get, I, I mean, carbon emissions a day. Uganda is just going to, and it, I mean, it produces more emissions, but with 200 barrels. So Uganda, that is going to produce only 60,000. Not even close. For, for, for the local people, only 60,000. 100 minus 1. Uh, no, let's, let's leave McLean to finish. How like sure second. are you? Uh, we should give it a benefit <laughs> of doubt. And, and uh, the, 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 eco, the, the, the people are also, they're also aiming at a, uh, a neutral carbon environment. Uh, they, are, they are advocating that there should be no flaring and ventilate the, 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 the put valves in, uh, in the pipes so that, that in case of any leakage, there is automatic stoppage. She talked about uh, people that, that, that the pipes that get problems and people come and they're like, eh, eh, time has gone too much. I've, I've gone without it being handled but with this in case it detects the, the leakage no let me tell you in, in, to the now, now to, to to this eco pipeline in case the leakage is de detected it stops there and then okay. it just okay. stops <laughs> that is what is being uh, done can i ask okay. my question okay yeah so, now let me let now. me you can ask your question uh, then we, i'm also asking a question to you you so, can first ask oh, mclean oh, okay mclean you had earlier on um hinted on the fact that uh, the students from Hoima mm. were demonstrating about their oil and uh, they know the impact and at the end of the day will be the ones suffering. 
Would you let your child take uh, a glass of juice that has poison because you it's know that juice. <laughs> because you know it's juice and the child wants to take it? No, it's it's not about that. Let me. That is if, what exactly no, 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 let, let, me let, let her respond. Let me respond to you. If 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 they are saying that maybe um there is something in maybe let me say in Kavale. And the people in Kabbalah are saying, no, we want this and this to be done. And that is what is being done. Can I please make a comment? Then please? what, you, you a person in no, Kampala, fine, you may see it is bad. But if the other person says it's good, they have their reasons and they have seen it rather than you who is in Kampala. For you, just depend on here, says on alleges. You know, but if, if they finished. say it themselves, then you ought to believe it. Okay. That what they're saying is the right thing. Did any of okay, those now here, no, let me now. Here comes my question to you. Make, yes. No, we'll so come back, we'll come, we'll come, we'll come to you, Fred. <laughs> we will make your statement later. Now, okay, my okay. question to you, Lenny, is yes. we have listened to the environmental and human rights issues yes. from Pauline, and uh, McLean brought out what the government is doing. My question is, do you think the government is doing enough? to remedy the human rights and environmental issues that have come up in the region? Uh, thank you. First, of, first and foremost, the government can never do enough in a country in Uganda, a country like Uganda, whereby uh, the citizens never seem to appreciate anything that the government does and uh, seem to oppose almost each and everything. However, I would uh, think the government is not doing sufficiently enough. Reason being one, when we look at um, what the government is doing, we talked about compensation, 70% compensation, and the 30% is not yet compensated. Why isn't the 30% compensated since 2012. since 2012? How many years have passed by? Over 10 years and you haven't finished the compensation of 30 people. Maybe because of resistance, as uh, Fred had earlier on hinted on, Bunyoro being a, resistant, a very resisting uh, area since time immemorial. Now, uh, it comes down to if you have falsification of documents coming up, there will always be issues of false documents. There will be issues of uh, ghost pieces of land. Mm -hmm. Land doesn't exist, but you find people's uh, yeah, requisitions are there in, uh, in the offices and all that, trying to acquire the money for land that is not there. Um, I believe the government is trying to do what it can do to have this oil project running because uh, they believe that uh, at the end of the day it will be a very good uh, project for Uganda to boost the economy. However, um, there is a lot that the government is not yet doing. When the EU wrote about the environmental challenges, pollution in uh, large sums of emission to come up of, that will come out of this uh, project, I feel like uh, the government right now should be focusing on how to stabilize the weather, the climate, because uh, we do believe that Uganda runs on agriculture. Um, Currently, where I come from in Arua, we still have rains uh, two seasons in a year. But of late, there are no rains. Rains come when they wish to. We always had dry Christmases. And as of now, we are having Christmases <laughs> under hailstorms. <laughs> we no longer go out to sit out and uh, have fun like we used to do. Because around that time, it's supposed to be dry, but it ends up raining for the last uh, seasons. five. As seasons have been entangled. You, you, you watch a weather forecast the night before, before leaving home, <laughs> and you're going to wear a black suit. When you wear a black oh, suit, because you assume it's going to be cold the following day, the sun hits you to the point that you drip soaking wet. So we, we are being affected by an environment, I mean, an environmental challenge that we are still wanting to push more negativity into it. Till when are we going to keep suffering? We are going to suffocate agriculture because of oil. Oil is a non-renewable resource. Time will come, it will get done. Yeah. It will not be there. But agriculture <clears throat> is one resource that lives on forever and ever. Okay. When this resource is not sufficiently, effectively, and properly handled, we are going to kill, we're going to kill our mainstream for a subsidiary. We're going, to divorce, be we're going to divorce with your wedded wife for... It is a scientific. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see that reasonably sensible. I mean, this is what I've given you kids. You have, uh, you have built together. schools, you have built everything, you have done a lot. And now she's giving uh, 
She, she, she's giving you everything you need. She's giving you roads. She's giving you luxurious cars. She's paying your members of parliament. <laughs> she is. Uh, she's giving you coffee. Your, your allowances. She's giving you everything you want. And at the end of the day, because you have seen one young uh, girl who's in Makerere, who is all uh, I don't know, and you feel like, yeah, damn, I should get that one. And you're going. Are you going to? Divorce with your wife who's been giving you each and everything because of this girl that you're not sure about her future with okay. you. And uh, one last thing. No one should lie to Ugandans that uh, the government is going to build schools, is going to, is going to build institutes, is going to build roads, is going to build an airport, or is building those things because of oil. It is the responsibility, it is the obligation and it is the role of the government to construct roads, to construct schools, to construct hospitals, and to have the economy running. No one should tell you that it's because of the oil. And, and it's it not should a not favor. be at the cost of the people. It is not a favor. I pay taxes willingly and unwillingly. Yesterday in the hotel where we slept, and uh, the services, each and everything you do, I mean like, bring each and everything you do in this country is attached to a particular tax. Of recent, I was seeing uh, on news these um, the chicken. Uh, I mean, the farmers of, of chicken poultry and all farmers. the poultry farmers. They are imposed. The, the the people who import concentrates. Yes, yeah. Yeah. feed concentrates. Feed concentrates. They imposed an eighteen percent tax on these people. Yeah. A rise of over sixty percent rise. Of With tax. deadly chemicals. And now, if you are even taxing chicken feed to that level, what what what, what more is for? What can these people do? What can okay. they do? No one should lie to us that that is it, and uh, that is their responsibility. They have to do it because we pay for these things bitterly. If you give a Ugandan a choice to choose to either pay taxes or not, I don't think people would. Uh... Yeah, at some point, our forefathers used to be in trees, the days of graduated tax. Okay, let me move to Fred. So, Fred, we are still looking at these environmental and human rights issues. And my question to you is, how best can these issues be addressed? Uh, can we remedy these issues and still benefit from the oil? Well, you cannot find a solution for a problem that is not in existence. That is one. You can go work so I don't expect even me to dress up if he didn't have anything to cover. <laughs> Should I be naked? <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a statement of fact. Oh, I don't expect you maybe in a suit while heading to the beach. So you always find a solution for a given problem at hand. Done. Right? Yes. Therefore, you cannot be stopped uh, uh, to going for a conference because it is raining. What will be the remedy? Get an umbrella. Yes, an umbrella will not cover you, the whole of you where well, the shoes will get some water. But you have to be there. I don't know if you're getting some sense out of my little sensible statement. That is me to judge. If, <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, look, if you look at the different problems that we have laid at hand, there are remedies. As Council McLean clearly stated, that 70% 70, 70 have been compensated. The third have not yet been compensated. We are looking at the 30, but there are issues there. Should we compensate a person who cannot prove that the land is his? Can we compensate a person? Can we compensate a person for a land that is under contention? There are over 20 people saying the land is theirs. Who should we compensate? What is the remedy there? Instead of giving these people money, let us get a resettlement, settlement. which has been yes. done. No, yes. It's still in plan. It's <laughs> you know, afraid it's, it's, it's to finish. It's not, it's not a guarantee that you have to be informed about everything. But when someone speaks, you pick and you get informed. A place or a, a settlement area is there. And many are refusing to go to that area. You get it? So the government in every way is trying to find a way and is trying to get remedies to these issues. And for the first remedy I've given you that we are they are taking these people. To at least a resettlement area. And in that resettlement area, they are putting different structures. Hospitals, well made roads, and churches, plus water areas. Then what do they need? That's one of the remedies. Two, about human rights. At times we, we all know we, we all know to choose to error, but at times they are what we call necessary errors. 
We'll get it. Look at the oil and the income that comes with the oil. And look at this old aged man who is saying, I'm not moving away from here because there is a shrine. This is where my forefathers my have been. Uh, they have been buried here so I cannot allow the pipeline pass. This, this, old woman, this old woman or man who is about 80 years is stopping a project that is going to help the young what? generation. At times, it is necessary that a higher step is taken. We evict this person by force. That will be taken as, an, uh, as a lawful eviction, saying he didn't consent what and what. But can we put the rest of the population at risk of not enjoying the, the pipeline project and the, the oil production thing just because of one old man? So okay. we are putting it, <coughs> we, the government is, is, getting, is, is getting ways of compensating these people. The government is getting ways of resettling these people however much they don't want because some of them are just rigid. Three, about the, 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 leaky, the leakages. Technology is there and technology is there to at least tackle some issues. She has talked about valves that in case a leakage is detected, then the valve will stop the saturation there and then. And you cannot avoid that. Nigeria's economy is developing. The oil industry is at least supporting ably the, the economy of, uh, the, of the, the GDP of Nigeria, right? But those leakages are there because in everything we do, we shall face some issues. But the valves are working out well. Let us go on these students that we are demonstrating here and there. When we are all doing law, we know the definition of rape. Can our knowledge of a woman's vagina without her consent or with forced consent? Yes. We all know the law regarding misrepresentation yes. and coercion. Imagine they, they get you from where they have got you, they take you to Corolla, they tell you we are going for a conference. After, they give you paper cards saying we, we want our oil. Yet someone mentioned earlier that it is my oil. Yeah. Well, to that, Madam Gender Fancy, I yeah. think the only solution would be death. The only solution okay. would be maybe some people knowing that it is off the limit and we should let it go. Now, the last step the government can take or should take or should be willing to take is to ably go down to the, to the ground and talk to these people. Inform them. You know, when you evict a person after sensitizing that person, it is far way better. You tell the old man, yes, your people are buried here. But this is to the younger generation. Instead of putting that person away by force. Okay. You educate them about the pipeline, but, but that well, the pipeline is going to pass, but we are going to put it beneath the soil. So other activities will still do what? Go on. The water, you tell them yes. After the pipeline, we shall reconstruct at least. So your issue is mm. there should be sensitization. Sensitization, mostly. Okay. Yeah. Let me move to Pauline. Yes. I see you have something to add. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that these are fellow Ugandans. <laughs> I really, I'm really surprised whether they also still live in the same country where I live today. And if I, for, according, there are a lot of inequalities. They talked about the, the job opportunities that are coming up. How many Ugandans have expertise in this? They talked about the 5,000 jobs that are coming up. How many Ugandans have expertise that are going to be employed in this eco project? We are looking at the deposits, the Tilenga and the Kingfisher, and the Kingfisher. project. Who are who are the who are the people in charge of this? We have Total in charge of the Klinger. We have we have Sinok in charge of the Kingfisher. These are all non-Ugandans. Those the, those themselves those are inequalities that the Ugandans are facing. They talked about compensating and leaving out the thirty percent. That because th this person has because we all have cultural rights for heaven's sake. We all have the cultural rights and the constitution provides for that. Our so, rights, so, but where so, are they? No, 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 let me, no, no, let, me ask, let me ask you just one question. Mm. So how best can Ugandans benefit from the oil while at the same time observing environmental and human rights issues? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, if what the project, what, the, what is in plan, for example, the plan is good. We are not refusing. The plan is really good. The eco plan is really good. Uh, how they're planned, how they're going to control the carbon emissions through that, that they say they're going to use the solar to heat the, to heat the oil. They're going to put valves to trap. They have also put trackers to trap the leakages. They've said they're going to recover the ecosystem after. And all this shows that we are going to recover back. But 
what my point here is this is the country where the levels where we lose 2.8 billion dollars every year in corruption 2.8 billion dollars every year in corruption and we're expecting and we're expecting 2 billion dollars in the oil how sure are we that this oil, this, 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 this profits we are getting out of this oil is also not going to be, to be diverted into the, is not going to be owned by that one family that always uses our money. How, how Ugandans are going to benefit from this whole project as a, as a person? First of all, maybe the first thing we, could, we should do is maybe be optimistic, whereby the word optimistic in Uganda no longer works. Okay. I feel like Ugandans, I feel like Ugandans, who come, who fa they can benefit fairly. They can benefit from this project. That is the developments that have been put. It is, ac it is through accepting the development that is going to take place, that ECOP is going to bring. That is that those are the infrastructures. Then we look at the roads that have been constructed. We offer our land. And then maybe if the, the, if the people are called upon, then maybe here we can talk to the people. If they have been called upon, then maybe here we need this land for this project. Maybe they can turn up. But the gov what the government should do is at least try to observe, to observe these human rights. And I think the government should have taken these measures before. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have come to the end of our debate for today. I know after this, we are going to have some serious you're, arguments. <laughs> you have actually <laughs> left me hanging. You, me too. <laughs> At this point I of time, I am. Okay then, then, okay, then you have a minute and a minute. Then okay. we conclude. Thank you so much. Did you know you were giving a final remark? She has talked about know. corruption. About corruption. I think there is this, this meme that goes on moving on Twitter. Nigeria is, is corrupt, what, what. And people are like, where is Uganda? And they're like, how can you count certain when you're counting sinners? sinners. Yeah, so even ECOP knows Ugandans are corrupt. <laughs> but uh, on the, I think on the 26th of, um, of May, yeah. when they came up and they asked you, they, they, they talked to, uh, to the IGG of, of, of Uganda and they're like, your country is corrupt. What are we going to do? One, uh, they advocated for transparency. Of course, it's not like they will tell us everything that will take place. But at least uh, the petroleum fund can come up and tell us we did this and this. You know, is our own. They can come and tell us we did this and this. Secondly, uh, she talked about um, the Leadership Code Act. That is going to that uh, actually that's what that that is the IGG. in twenty twenty one the IGG um Miss um Betty Kamia. Betty Kamia. <laughs> she 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 talked about the leadership code act. The leadership code act is something that is it it's going to be like let me say the way we are here. Um <laughs> But, but, okay, please conclude. We yeah, it, it's time. going to be like targeting people's wealth. They're going to be you, you, you have, you'll have to declare your wealth by the end of maybe the month. If you have something more than you're expected to have, you should be answerable. You tell us where you got it all okay. from. That is how they can fight corruption. Okay, let me leave. Uh, let me conclude. Um, as I conclude, one thing I can say is that one of the finished products of Uganda's oil is corruption. <laughs> Whether we agree to it, or do not agree, corruption is going to be one of the one of the products that's going to flow in the pipelines from whichever <laughs> to Tanga. <laughs> Tanga. Yes, it's going to be there. It's going to run 1,200 uh, kilometers. This is a very good project that can elevate Uganda's economy and that can change uh, lots of social economic issues in Uganda. However, we have to check on the few errors of human rights. We have to check on the few errors of um, environmental challenges and we have to check on corruption. If we check on these three issues, this is one of the best projects Sam um, Seveni has done in his Indeed. tenure of okay. office. And um, by the mere fact that uh, the EU parliament sitting in Brussels wrote about uh, these issues, these people are not doing whatever they are writing for the best of Ugandans. However, we should appreciate the fact that what they are saying it's actually true. exists it's and uphold and check on them. That is all I can say about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank this you. group will not stop arguing. We will carry the discussion to the boardroom. <laughs> we have come to the end of our debate session for today. I would like to say thank you so much to students of Islamic University in Uganda, Mbale Campus. 
for gracing our invitation and uh, coming through for the inter-university debate. Thank you so much, Fred, Pauline, Macklin, and Lemmy. So I would like to say thank you so much for uh, organizing this debate, and that is to Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV. Thank you so much to the viewers for watching. And till next time, I would like to say thank you and bye.